Hello, this is Jose Luis here at Parametric Camp and welcome to another video in our Al algorithmic modeling challenges or fun experiments or whatever you want to name it. In this video, what I wanted to do was to give it a try to create procedurally a small voxel world modeler. So what I'm going to do is very inspired by, yes, you name it, uh, the Minecraft video game. What I wanted to do was to write an algorithm to create some kind of terrain that has all these features, like for example, uh, some kind of some kind of terrain that has like nice waves and then there's like a distinction between grass and dirt and maybe stone and maybe there's some water and maybe there are some caves hiding somewhere underneath. But I also wanted to do this in a way that is procedural. So where we do it at the voxel level and where we also manipulate a certain degree of a statistical randomness. So for example, now I have implemented this seed, which is giving me the possibility to change between different random configurations of the terrain, the holes that are generated, etc. And by doing this at a voxel level, what I have is the capacity to control the type of terrain or the type of block that each one of the voxels in my world is. And then using some plugins like voxel tools, what I can do is I can generate individual watertight meshes for each one of for each one of the um, for each one of the of the materials, so that I end up with some kind of render mesh with materials and transparencies. And if I do a clipping plane, what you can see is that I can start now cutting through the sections of my terrain and analyzing what is water, what is I can find where the diamonds are hidden. I can see the cave formations, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And of course, this is all procedural, so I can choose how big my terrain is going to be, the randomness, I can add features, and probably you could extend this into adding trees, adding moths, and adding more what underwater um, features, etc. etc. This is just I want to teach you the basic foundations of how modeling procedurally with equation, with algorithms, and at the voxel level could look like for complex three-dimensional environments like this one, okay? So I hope you're gonna enjoy it. I had a lot of fun recording this video. So let's get busy and, um, and let's, get, let's give this a try. Oh, I forgot to say, this uh, video is going to assume that you are familiar with computer programming and that you're familiar with the Grasshopper development environment. If you are not, I have a playlist called Advanced modeling and advanced development in Grasshopper that will help you get the understanding and get the baseline of the techniques to do this. So if you're not familiar with that, I strongly suggest you take a look at that playlist. It's on a card that is going to pop up here in the corner somewhere. Okay. All right, let's dive in. Fantastic. Let's get started. So Full disclaimer, what I would like to disclose is that um, the way we're going to do this, I'm not going to focus on optimization performance. I'm not going to focus on uh, making this a very fast process. What I would like to do is I would like to focus on the design aspect of how do we create using algorithms, this idea of a procedural world or an environment that has been generated by combining functions, equations, probability, et cetera, et cetera. So I'm sure if you are an expert computer scientist who's been working on procedural worlds or video game for many years, you will be horrified about what I'm going to do. But uh, this is my audience, I think, are more beginners or people who are trying to figure out what, what this looks like. So I may take some shortcuts and I may try to focus on getting something nice done as opposed to doing it fast or in an optimal way. All right. But whenever I see room for optimization, I'll try to make sure that I pinpoint what things could be changed to make the process better. Okay, so how are we going to do this? Well, the first thing that I would like to conceptualize is that we're not going to be working with meshes or nerves. We're going to be working with a voxelized space. What that means is that we're going to take a chunk of 3D space in our rhino slash grasshopper world, and we're going to discretize that in homogeneous chunks that we're going to call voxels. And then 
But using the metaphor of Minecraft, what we're going to do is that for each one of those voxels, we're going to use algorithms to calculate if that, if that voxel should be air, if it should be dirt, if it should be stone, if it should be water, or if it should be whatever additional block types we're going to be designing procedurally. So what I would like to do is I would like to write a big, nice and fat algorithm to basically go over all the voxels in my environment and using equations, using functions and using probabilistic and randomness, what I'm going to do is I'm going to decide which type each one of those voxels should be. And then once I decide that type, which I'm probably going to represent with numbers, so zero for the air, one for dirt, two for water, something along those lines, right? So we're going to keep it simple here. Once I have decided which type each block is going to be, what I would like to do is I would like to somehow visualize that. For that visualization, I'm going to be using some plugins, I'm going to be using some marching cubes algorithms to generate a mesh that is the wrapper of these voxels. And so stay tuned for that, okay? So what I would like to do first is before we start writing any nice crazy algorithms for, um, for, the, ter for the terrain itself, what I would like to do is I would like to cut through the entire workflow and get something very, very simple done, including visualization, so that then when we have a basic algorithm and a visualization system, then we can now start working on improving the algorithm and get a nice, interesting set of uh, terrain features. Okay, so I'm going to cut very fast through the whole process to get to some kind of visualization of a basic terrain. Okay, so what is that going to look like? Well, it's going to look something like this. What I'm going to go is I have my grasshopper C sharp component. In this component, I have created a, an input for how many voxels in the X, Y and C direction we're going to have. So that's going to be integers. All right. And then what I would like to do here is I would like to write some algorithm first to generate tiny points representing the corners of those boxes in 3D. So that's going to be one thing. And the second to recreate and to generate a, a list of numbers that are going to represent those blocks of types. Because I'm going to be working on a three dimensional space of discrete voxels, what I'm going to do is that I'm going to represent those numbers, I'm going to arrange them in a, in a square array with three dimensions. So that looks something like this, I'm going to define an array with one, two and three dimensions. So that's two commas. And I'm going to call this block types. All right, and I'm going to initialize this array to an array that is going to contain vx elements in the first dimension. So the amount of boxes in the x direction, vy in the second direction and vz in the third direction. Okay, so it's an array that has, it's a cubic array, basically, because it has three different dimensions for each one of the three sides of this cube of numbers, if you will. Okay. And then what I'm going to do is I'm going to I'm going to initialize these numbers to the most basic algorithm I can think of. So I'm going to, first of all, do a for loop where I'm going to go through v is less than vx, x, and so all the x coordinates, all right, all the y coordinates, uh, y is less than the amount of voxels in the y direction, i plus plus. Sorry, I'm going to make this a little bigger for those of you who are watching this on mobile devices and for int z equals zero, I'm sorry, I said z equals zero, c is less than the amount of voxels in the x star in the z direction and c plus plus, and that's too many pluses. <laughs> okay, and then here what I'm going to do is I'm going to define a variable called t that is going to be the type of this voxel that I'm going to be working on. So what I would like to do now is I would like to make some kind of convention and say block types, for example. And my internal convention is going to be that zero is going to be air, for example. And one is going to be, for example, dirt, if we are sticking to the Minecraft metaphor, okay? So what I can do is I can say, you know what? I'm going to start by making all the block types. I'm going to start with air. 
Okay, so type T is going to be zero. And then what I can do is I can say block types in the X, Y, and C location. Sorry. You see, I need to, I haven't had enough coffee this morning. <laughs> block types in this, in this location is going to be equal to this number that I just generated. Again, right now, this is just a purely, purely empty, uh, a purely, purely empty voxel space. Or maybe it doesn't have to be so empty. Maybe what I want to say is, you know what? If the Z location of this voxel that I'm looking at right now is less than half of the height, so it's less than VZ, and because I'm working with integers, I'm going to use integer division here. If C is less than half of the height of my voxel space, you know what? I'm going to change T and I'm going to make it dirt. So what that will do is it will create a flat world where half the voxels under the half the world are dirt and the top are going to be air. Okay. And I'm going to stop. The, I'm going to, I'm going to initialize to air and then should this be dirt? All right. And I'm going to keep it like this. Very simple. Now, what I want to do is I want to cut through the workflow and get as fast as possible to the end so that I can visualize this. So I'm going to stick with this very simply. All right. So what am I going to do now? What I need to do is I need to make sure that I output in voxel values, I output these numbers here. However, I decided by choice to create a three dimensional array for representing these blocks because it's just very convenient because I have the three dimensions. It's just going to make a lot of things easier in the algorithms and for locating block types in the array. But Grasshopper is not great at working with multidimensional arrays. So what I need to do is I need to actually flatten this array and take all the numbers and put them one after the other in a long array that is just one dimensional. The way to do that in C sharp is a little esoteric, if you will. <laughs> I found that out uh, very recently. Um, I so there's two ways we can do this. So we can either do it the <clears throat> fast C sharp way, or we can do it the manual way. I'm going to do it the manual way because I have found that. So I'm going to flatten the integer list. All right. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to create a an integer list, which is going to be all the types, and that's going to be a new integer array. And the size is going to be the size of block types. If I do block types dot length, what this gives me is the total length, the multiplication of the three dimensions. All right. And then I, what I can do is I can use another nested for loop where I go through every, where I go through every object and I push that to the array. So for that, I'm going to create here an iterator. All right. To keep track of where I am. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to say in types dot iterator in that position, I'm going to store this value that I just created. And I need to make sure to update one unit every time I'm iterating through the array. Okay. So that will take each one of the elements in the three dimensional array and save it into an order position in the one dimensional array here. And then here, I'm going to say voxel values is going to equal to these types that I just generated. Let's see if this works. So I'm going to press OK. And it looks like it's working surprisingly. And if I plug in here, if I plug in a panel, you're going to see that this is mostly a bunch of ones and zeros, which is what I would expect, right? And it's actually 131,000. Yes. So this is going to get very complicated and very heavy very soon. Okay. Beautiful. So I do have a basic numerical description of all the possible voxels, voxels in my 3D space. So what I would like to do now is I would like to figure out a way to represent this in 3D space and have some kind of visualization. Okay. 
The way I'm going to do that is that I'm going to be using this plugin called Voxel Tools, which comes with very interesting and very simple uh, plugins, very simple components to, for generating meshes and shapes from voxel and from scalar uh, voxel grids. Okay, I'm actually working right now with Victor Lin, who is in the chat, I believe, and we are extending this uh, plugin for uh, to include sine distance functions, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So it's kind of it's kind of fun. But anyway, so if you use the standard version, what you will be able to see is that you can create voxel grids and voxel grids are basically a grid of true and false values as simple as that so creating what we can do is we can create a voxel grid all right for the voxel grid we have to define the size of the pixel in the x y and z direction so for me it's going to be one unit okay and i'm cutting through and oversimplifying the generation of this I'm assuming that the voxel terrain is centered at zero, zero, but you could improve the algorithm to center it somewhere else, all right? And then for here, I'm going to create a box from domains. The box is going to be centered at zero, zero, and the domains are going to be zero to 64, zero to 64, and zero to 32. I'm going to plug that in, and you can see that the voxel grid component already gives me this visualization of the voxel space, which is right now empty, okay? What I can do is I can say, I can create, what I'm going to do is I can create, I can assign values to each one of the voxels in this space. And because voxel grid in voxel tools is a super, super simple grid of voxels where each value can either be true or false, what I can do, what I need to do is I need to create this voxel space by creating a list of true and false values. And those are the ones that are going to define what's inside the voxel space and what's outside of the voxel space. So let me use voxel grid from list. Okay, so voxel grid from list, it, what it does is it takes the grid that you want to modify and it takes a list of true and false values for all the cells in this voxel grid, which as you can see here is 64 by 64 by 32. So, <clears throat> excuse me. So, but the problem is that here, what I do have is numbers. I have zeros and ones because I will have many different types of blocks. So the only thing that I need to do is I need to create individual voxel spaces for each one of the materials that are going to be in my world. So for example, Let's say that I'm going to use the Boolean operator here to check for equality, all right? And I'm going to say, all these values that you got me here, are those equal to the value of one, which is dirt, all right? And then with this, what I'm going to get is a list of true and false values. So if I plug that list of true and false values, I will get a modified, I would get a mesh that is wrapping everything that is the value of one and it's not wrapping anything that is the value of zero. Remember how we said we said this very simple rule that the grid, the dirt is going to be anything that is half the size of the vertical size of the voxel space. So that's that's what you got here. And then I can use the visualization tools to just generate some kind of material and to visualize this geometry using this material. And if I say, for example, this is going to be brown, for example, then I have already here, I have this like brownish kind of terrain, right? That is all the voxels that have the value of one. So this is going to be, I'm going to wrap this up. I'm going to say this is going to be dirt, okay? There you go. And what's nice about this is that you can see that if I now start messing with the algorithm and say, you know what, maybe it shouldn't be half, maybe it should be a quarter. So I'm going to update this and you see that now it's only a fourth of, or maybe it should be, um, maybe it should be three quarters. So maybe I have to multiply this by three times, blah, blah, blah. Okay, so now it's a big fuller, you see? <clears throat> so this was half, okay? 
Beautiful. So this is exactly what I want it to be. So right now we have the basics of a full workflow where we have a voxel space that has been defined by individual units, where for each unit, in this case voxels, I am defining an integer number that I'm using to set which type of block it is. And then here with voxel tools, what I'm doing is for I'm choosing all the voxels that match this particular number and I'm wrapping those voxels with a mesh that I can also bake here. So if I make it, actually, you will be able to see that what I get is this mesh that if I can zoom in and I can do, for example, uh, you can see that this mesh is basically done made with squares. You can see that it's basically made with squares because each one of these squares being the voxels that I have defined, correct? Beautiful, all right. So, well, now we have the basic workflow. I think it's about time that we start getting into the cool stuff and start ch changing the voxel terrain generation to make it more interesting and to make it more exciting. So let's start adding some features here. The first thing we're going to do is we are going to make the terrain a bit more exciting, obviously. So right now we just have this very simple rule, have the voxels are dirt, half the voxels are air, but of course we want something a bit more wavy, a bit more organic, etc. etc. So anyone in their right mind for this purpose would use what's called some kind of noise function. For example, purling noise is very popular for this, and you can see that if you Google purling noise, right away you already have people using purling noise for terrain generation, procedurally. It's a very, very common technique, right? The only problem is that unfortunately in this tool set that I'm using, Rhino and Grasshopper, I don't really have access to an easy and straightforward purling noise generation function. And in order to write that from scratch, that deserves its own video, which I actually want to do at some point, but I haven't. So I'm not going to be using this, but if you are working in Unity, Houdini, um, any other environment, please use a noise function for this. It will give you a much nicer result. What I'm going to use is I'm going to use some kind of combination and overlapping of sines and cosine functions. It will give me something more regular, so it won't be as nice or as organic, but I think it's going to work for as a prototype, okay? What does that mean? What it means is I want to, I'm going to be using Graftoy as a way to illustrate what I want to do. Graftoy is this tool by Inigo Keyless, which helps you visualize uh, very fast sign um, functions in a 2D environment. So for example, if I start with a sign function that based on the distance along the x-axis gives me a variable height that oscillates between positive one and minus one, I can do some modifications to this sine wave to say, you know what? I don't want to start from zero. I want to start from some value in the pixel array. So I can say, well, whatever this is needs to be 10 units higher. So you can see that I have basically moved the function 10 pixels or 10 voxels in the Z direction, right? Or what I can also say is, you know what? Variation between one and minus one, it's a little too small because it won't give me, because it, all the values are going to be between 11 and 9. So what I can do is I can multiply the effect of this by, for example, the value of 3, you know, and then the sine wave becomes more prominent, much bigger, all right? Or, for example, what I can do is I can work with the amplitude and I can say, well, if I multiply this by 2, then the sine wave is has a higher frequency, or if I multiply by 0.2, the sine wave is much more gentle, the amplitude is much, the, the frequency is much lower, all right? So you can see that very simple numerical operations have a very interesting effect on the value here. So let's try to implement something like that. So I'm going to go to Voxel Terrain and I'm going to go to my algorithm here and I'm going to modify this part here. What it says, should it be dirt? Now it's not going to be a rule that is as simple as is it below half the height of the world. I'm going to cancel this and I'm going to write something a bit more sophisticated, okay? So what is that going to be? 
is going to be, I'm going to calculate, for example, the value of a sine wave that was going here in the x direction. We're going to start with the x direction only. And I'm going to say, for example, the height of the sine is going to be some value that is going to start at half the height. So Vz divided by 2 is going to start there. So we're moving the sine wave up. And then I'm, to that, I'm going to add math.sign. And this is going to be some kind of value based on how far away we are in the x direction. And then what I'm going to do is I'm going to say if, <clears throat> excuse me, if the z value of this height is smaller or equal to that sign value, then what I would like to do is I would like to say that the, uh, so then I'm going to turn this into dirt, all right? So basically, instead of just half, I'm going to calculate if any of the voxels is inside of this sine wave. I'm going to press play on this, and it's not going to work because <laughs> I made some kind of mistake. S, yes, sorry. So this would, should be 2. It should be the value of 2, all right? And then you can see that what I get is a very, very fast kind of sine wave. So if I, and also the sine wave is one pixel wide. So if I multiply this by three, you can see that now I'm going to get this kind of very jaggy sine wave <laughs> in one direction. So that's also not cool. So I want to make this a bit more ample. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to divide this by some kind of largish number. So I'm going to go for 32, all right? And I'm going to add here the dot zero because I want to make sure that this operation, because this is an integer, I want to make sure that this operation is a, a, is a double operation, so that the result of this is not an integer division, it's a double value, right? And now you can see that this sine wave is much more gentle, all right? And probably if I extend the voxel field in 256 in the x direction, I'm probably going to see how the sine wave is extending, you see? This is very nice. So what is the front view? Can you see how the sine wave is now? And if I were to crank up this multiplier, then I would get a sine wave that is going to be higher. You see, there is a more like up and down, correct? Beautiful. So, but obviously a sine wave in one direction is kind of boring. All right, so how can I uh, make this a little cooler? I can, in the y direction, I can combine this with a cosine wave. So what I can do is, you know what? The value of this plus the sine wave. And then here, what I'm going to do is, I'm going to, oops, I'm going to add, for example, math.cosine, and then this cosine is going to be looking at the value in the y direction. We're also going to, divide this by some kind of value just to give it some kind of nice amplitude. And I'm going to also, so that the cosine wave is not one pixel, one voxel wide, I'm going to amplify this by, for example, a factor of three. I'm hard coding a lot of things here. And of course you could do this by having parameters, input parameters, but guess what? Can you see this? Whoa, this is starting to look a little nicer, right? So this is the combination of a sine wave in one direction and a cosine wave in the other direction, which is giving me this now patch that has like this kind of like double curvature sort of situation, which starts to be much nicer. So I'm going to delete this here, okay? And maybe we're gonna, we're gonna stick to this for the time being. Are we, are we, wait, are we going to do that? One thing that I would like to highlight is the fact that because we're using sines and cosines, which are, let's call these regular or periodic functions, then if we were actually to extend the terrain to a much larger x, y dimension, you can see that very soon we start perceiving that there's a repetition of the pattern of highs and lows or mountains of, or valleys, right? So obviously if we were making this for a video game, this would not be very exciting. What are tricks that we can do to make this a bit more exciting? So what we can do is like we can just keep overlapping and superimposing 
more of these functions to try to give the sine and the cosine a bit more of an irregular feel. So for example, this uh, prototype of the function that we had before. So look at what happens if I just make this, if I calculate the sine of this function itself. You start seeing that what we get is the superimposition of a sine function on top of another sine function. And you can see that this starts having a bit more of an organic feel you can see that there is still some kind of repetition going on, you know, but, um, but I mean, there's like, and if maybe I can start multiplying this by some weird number, and then maybe I can do another sign of this, you know, and then I get this kind of like more irregular variation perhaps. And I think playing with these values sometimes just gives like interesting results um, about, well, this is perhaps too much right or 56 you know and if i were to now make a similar one here with the cosine and um, different values for example here and different periods so for example that's going to be 2 power 5 and this is going to be 3 and using decimals for this thing is pretty good because um, it just makes the repetition not overlap at regular intervals so if i were to do this it looks like the overlap of the two doesn't follow a, a pattern, which I think is gonna give us some interesting repetition. So I'm going to move this here. I'm going to, because this is already a little heavy, it took four seconds to compute this. I'm going to now try to come here and say, well, the sine function was math, dot, this is what I prototype in Graftoid, math sine of all this stuff here, right? All this stuff here. And then plus math cosine dot cosine of all this stuff here. And then I did get some math sign. This was, I did, I think I did 2.5.56. I'm going to keep that value there. I oh, know I did three nested signs, sorry. I did math.sign and then 2.56 of this and then another one and here I'm going to add another nested cosine so that's going to be and I could probably combine sines and cosines here this and this and here and I'm going to give this some kind of offset the offset is going to be inside of the sine wave the sine wave of this plus that, plus some kind of offset here with some decimals, and then some kind of offset here with some decimals. Okay, and I'm going to try this and see if it works. Uh, again, all of this is like a lot of trial and error on, your, on our end. Let's see what this looks like now. It might be cool. It's going to take more because I've added more sines and cosines, which are not a very cheap operation. Let's see what that looks like. All right. Well, we can still see like some sort of pattern repetition, but at least it's a little more diverse. All right. I don't like it that there aren't highs and lows anymore. I think we need to probably crank up these numbers here to five point something and five point something. And so that we have a bit more of variation in the Z height. I would like that. Let's see what we get. Okay. Well, Eh, I don't know how I feel about this. Yeah, I don't know how I feel about this. Anyway, but you get the point, right? So I'm going to disable the solver. I'm going to reduce this. I'm going to reduce this. And I'm going to turn the solver again. And that should be much faster. And now I get this kind of... Um, yeah, this is not great. <laughs> okay, so I'm going to tamper down some of these all right let me try to let me try to tweak this so to something that it looks a bit better okay i was trying things out but i couldn't really quite get something that i was satisfied with so i kind of gave up 
and I went back to like a simpler sine and cosine with like with not so much nesting. It will probably not be as nice if I make a large chunk of terrain, but it's definitely going to look nicer now on this sort of um, on this sort of a smaller contain, right? Okay, beautiful. So the next thing that I probably want to implement is, for example, we're going to try to implement water. And uh, for water, but what we can do is just a very simple check where you're saying, where you're saying if, <clears throat> where you're saying if after the calculation for the terrain, we have a block that it's under half the height of the block, then what we want to do is we want to turn that into water. But if it is a dirt, it means that it's a mountain. So we don't want to turn that into water. So here, we should be, should be dirt. And then here, um, fill in with water. So what we're going to do here is we're going to say, if C is less than half of the height of the, of the block, of the entire block, and T is not dirt, or if T is actually, or maybe we can do it if T is air, maybe that's a bit more correct then assign the value of two to the type, all right? And I'm going to do here, I'm going to say now two is going to be water, all right? So I'm going to run this, nothing is going to change because what I need to do is I need to expand the, my visualization to add a new case here where I say, if this is the value, if any block is the value of two, and you see how this also got covered, then just use, blue here, right? And then all those pixels now turn get turned into water. And perhaps I can add some transparency here where this is now going to be 0 0.5, for example, you know, and we get like some kind of transparent water, which is not rendering great right now, but it will render a bit better when we, when we bake this. Okay, beautiful. What is the next thing that we can do here? Next thing we're going to do is, if you remember Minecraft, I mean Minecraft, when you're playing Minecraft, you know that the terrain is not homogeneous. You know that there is a random chance that you get some minerals the farther you go down uh, at certain levels and the distribution and the probability of finding those minerals depends on the mineral and depends on the height or the depth of where you are in the terrain. And in order to do that, that involves what I call creative manipulation of randomness. So we're going to try to do something similar to that. So what I would like to do now is I would like to go ahead and say, and create some kind of rule where based on some randomness and some probabilistic distribution, we're going to at random make some of these voxels, uh, we're gonna turn them into coal, for example, okay? So let's do that. So what I'm going to do is in order to work with randomness, in C Sharp, what we do is we create what's called a random object, and then we use that random object to fetch random numbers whenever we need to, okay? So th that way that works is that I'm going to create an object of the class random, and it's going to be a new random object, okay? But I don't want, I want to have some kind of stability to my solutions. What that means is that I don't want to create a random object that is going to always give me random solutions. And if I ever get to one solution that I like, because this is so random, I won't be able to come back to that solution. The way to control that is by using what's called a seed number, which basically locks the initial state of the random number generator so that whenever you use the same seed, all the random numbers that you will get out of that generation are always going to be the same. You basically turn your random number generator into a deterministic random number generator that will always generate the same numbers. I forget if I have a video on this, actually. Um, I hopefully have uh, some, and if I don't, um, if I have one, it will be popping as a card here in the description. Uh, but if I don't, um, so I'm going to create here an integer and that's going to be the seed and that's going this is going to be some some number i'm going from you can use some random number for example from 0 to 1000 or whatever it doesn't really matter so 
then what I'm going to do here is I'm going to start applying this randomness to figure out if the value should be cold or not. So for example, here, should populate with coal, all right? So the first thing that I want to do is at this point, I want to check if my, um, if my, let's, let me say this again. If the block that I'm checking is currently of the type dirt, because I don't want to put coal wherever there's water or wherever there's air. So if T equals equals one, then what I'm going to do is I'm going to basically throw the dice. I'm going to get a, I'm going to say, give me a random number. So rnd dot next double. So I'm going to get a random number. And what this will give me is a value between zero and one. There's, when I get numbers with decimal precision, there's only that range that you can ask from the C sharp random object. And then what I can do is I can use that number to calculate the probability of this, of this uh, particular block turning into coal. So for example, let me work with a ridiculously high probability. I'm going to say if the random number is less than 0 0.5, which means I have a 50% chance of turning this dirt block into coal. If this is true, then T, I'm going to make it the value of three. And I'm going to go here and say three should be the value of coal, okay? Just as simple as that. And you're going to see that as soon as I press go for this, then basically this is going to become a Gruyere cheese because literally half the blocks that were dirt are now turned into coal, correct? So I'm going to, make sure that I visualize this by creating another case and another mesh where if the value is equal to three, then I'm going to turn this into black and with no transparency whatsoever. All right, obviously this is not what we want. So we have two options. We either place an input here, which is some kind of definition of the probability of getting coal, or I hard code the number. Right In Minecraft, for example, the number is hard coded, we cannot access it. So let me make this much, much smaller. So 0 0.05, all right? And then you can see that now the probability is much lower, all right? But I still get quite a few. So 0 0.01, all right? Beautiful, and I still get some of the surface and some not. Now, an even better approach to this that we could implement is the fact that Mm, the fact that, let's say, um, in real Minecraft, the way I believe it works is that the probability of coal showing up is not the same based on any voxel in the Minecraft world. There is actually a higher chance of coal showing up the deeper you go down in the Z height which actually in Minecraft, I believe is the Y height, it's not the C height, but that's a different story because of the coordinate system in Minecraft. Anyway, so what I would like to do is here, I basically am saying that there's an equal chance of coal showing up no matter how deep the block is. But I don't want that. I want a distribution where coal should be harder to find if we are very close to the surface and it will be more abundant if we are closer to the depth. So the way I can do that is by saying, by improving this rule and saying if the chance of getting coal is bigger, is, uh, if, if the chance is smaller than 0 0.1 and then implementing here a way of making this probability even smaller, the higher we are in C. So how do we know how high we are in Z? What we can do is we can calculate the relative the relative distance of where we are in the sea height. So we can say, um, so we can say, for example, Z divided by VC, that basically means a number from zero to one, which is zero when, if we are here and one if we are here or vice versa. And then what we can do is like we can multiply this by 0 0.1 and subtract it 
from and subtract it from this. What that means is that this number from 0 to 1 will be multiplying 0 and 1. And then, therefore, this number will be subtracted by an increasingly larger number the higher we go in the z height. So let me show you this. If I press play, you can see that now we have very, very few dots, very, very few call objects on the top. But you can see that on the bottom, we still get plenty of them. So what we're implementing here is basically a rule that makes it inversely likely that there is call the higher we go in the z height. Okay. Beautiful. How was that? Are you enjoying this so far? You want to see more? Another nice thing that we could implement here is right now, all the dirt is very homogeneous. So I wonder if still inspired by the Minecraft um, metaphor, I wonder if we could do something where at least the first or the first two blocks of, um, of, the, of the terrain are grass and then dirt starts one block deeper or similar. So I'm going to try something like that. So for example, we have the dirt, we've generated the dirt, we have the water, all right? So probably what I can do is I can say, maybe after the water generation, I can say, should this block be grass, all right? And grass is going to be number four, okay? And then what I'm going to do is, first of all, I would like to figure out how deep this voxel that I have right now is compared to the um, compared to the um, the sine wave. So how far away from the sine wave is? And if we are around one voxel away, then that means that we are very superficial. So what I'm going to do here is I'm going to calculate the C depth uh, from the surface. So surface depth, for example, and that's going to be the ceiling of dividing, uh, of subtracting the sine h, which is a double, minus where I am in the C of this voxel. So this is the height of the voxel that I'm checking in, and this is the height of the sine. So when I'm taking this, I am subtracting them and I'm, and I'm rounding it up because I need an integer because I want to know if I'm one block away, two blocks away, and I need to cast this to an integer because ceiling will return a double value. So now with this value will tell me if I am at depth 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, or minus 1, minus 2, depending if, if I'm in the air, correct? So this will be interesting also down the road if I want to use this depth for some kind of other calculation. So what I can do here is I can say, for example, if, um, if the surface depth here equals zero, right? Let, let, let's start with this. If the surface depth is zero, then um, should I turn this into a grass block? And I've already implemented here at the very end, using taking the green blocks, taking the number four and turning it into green blocks. So I've already included this as an additional case here. So what I can do now is, yes, this is working so far. If the depth is zero, you can see that all the top pixels become grass, correct? But something has happened. So first of all, when I didn't have this, I had more water. Is that correct? Yes, I have replaced water with this, which is not cool. So maybe a better way of doing this, if the surface depth is one and in the C, if the surface is, if the depth is one, then I'm going to turn, I'm going to add yes. If the depth is one, then I'm getting the yes. So the depth has to be one. Now, something that is not working well is that I don't want grass under my water. So something that I can do here is I can also calculate and if C is uh, greater than VZ divided by two, right? So that all the pixels, all the voxels, now, nah, so Z 
minus one is or not. Oh, so yeah, yeah. So wait, so this is plus one. I never get this right on the first try, and this is greater or equal. I never get this right the first time. So yes, so now the green only gets to the bottom of the water, but it doesn't get inside underneath, right? Maybe we can write a, a rule where this, we turn this into sand. I wonder if we could do that. Yes, I think we're going to give it a try to do sand. So I'm going to choose the number five for sand. And then here, should this block be sand? And then you can see that I already have the depth. So what I can do is I can pretty much just copy this and say, if the surface depth is one, because still these voxels here are one pixel away from the sine wave. But what I'm going to do here is I'm going to say if instead of greater or equal, if this is less than half the height of the terrain, then this is going to be turned into the value of five. What that means is that this is looking at the pick at the voxels that are one voxel away from the surface, but are also below half of the terrain, which is basically where the water is going to stand. Okay. So beautiful. So we now have our terrain. It has grass, it has dirt, it has um, this kind of uh, water here. I think it's great. Okay. So, all right. So uh, is, can we just keep the dirt to, let's say, two or three dirt blocks? And then can we do the rest on stone? Can we implement something like that? The way I'm going to try to do this is going to be fairly simple, let's say. Remember how we created for the dirt, we created this sine and cosine overlapping surface. And then we've always calculated how far away we were from that surface to decide if it was a dirt block or if it was air. And then we just basically computed like a one voxel wide scenario to change those pixels to grass, correct? Well, I'm going to use a very similar technique to create a layer of stone rocks below this. And what I would like to do now is I'm going to basically take the same algorithm that I did for the sine and cosine. And what I'm going to create is I'm going to create another sine and cosine overlapping surface underneath. So it's not going to be so high anymore. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to tweak the numbers just so slightly so that this surface is not exactly parallel. It doesn't have the exact same rhythm, but it has a slight offset or a slight variation so that we can see that at certain areas, the width of the dirt is going to be larger. And in some areas, the width is going to be a little smaller. This will give me this effect of the different layers of the terrain not being homogeneous. And if you see this out in nature, you see how sometimes like certain uh, geologic layers in mountains have like different widths and it's the result of the formation of things over the course of the centuries. Well, you know where I'm going. All right. So what are we going to do? All right, so I'm going to add here to my legend. This is going to be stone. And then should we, this be sand? It's going to stay here. And then should this block be stone? So what I'm going to do is I'm going to calculate. I'm going to compute here something similar sign height for stone. And here, for example, the starting height, instead of being half of the block, is going to be a quarter. So I'm going to move this entire sine wave. The baseline of the sine wave is going to be here. And then what I'm going to do is I'm going to very slightly modify this 0.1 and then 2.9 to just give it a tiny bit of a different offset. And here I'm going to do 31 and I'm going to do, for example, 18. So what this is going to do is it's going to create a very, very similar rhythm with, with a tiny bit of a slight difference. And then what I can do is I can say, ah, how can I calculate this now? If, um, if Z, let me say this, if 
z is less than sine h stone, then t should probably be the value of 6. Okay? Is that correct? Um, is that correct? Uh, let me try that out. I'm going to do this. And then a bunch of blocks should disappear here. Okay? Which is kind of looking all right. I'm going to add the condition here. I'm going to just copy paste all of this. I'm going to add here the number 6. And I'm going to add here the value of gray. Correct? And yes. And it looks like I created that effect. And it looks like you can see that there's a little bit of an offset here. It's not exactly the same. And here there is a little bit of an offset. It's still very, very similar. So if I want to give it a bit more of variation, I may want to tweak around slightly this value. So I may want to do 29 and I may want to do 19.5. No, this has to be an integer we set. All right. So, well, this doesn't have to be an integer. I, I take that back, you know? All right. Beautiful. So you see this, correct? All right. So now we see this variation, this variation here. We see more depth here. We see less here. I like this. So maybe this could also be 3.5 so that we make it a little, a little higher. Yeah, so we reduce this layer here. Interesting. So it's getting, it's getting interesting. Now, one thing that we broke as we did this was that the coal is only being populated on blocks that are previously dirt. So what we can do is we can say if t equals 1 or if t equals equals, we want to populate this in the rock. Or we may want to do it also in the grass. So sorry, if this is not and, this is or, and this is or. We may want to let the grass turn into coal blocks. Do we want to do that? Is that a Minecraft thing? I don't think that's a Minecraft thing. So I'm not going to do that. I'm not going to do that. Okay, beautiful. And then you see that now the coal blocks are showing up here. All right, it looks like we are getting somewhere. All right, <laughs> this is kind of cool. I'm liking this a lot. What else we could do? Could we do? Before we move on to more complex things, I kind of want to implement diamonds. As you probably have already have figured out, I really much, I very much like Minecraft. <laughs> so I feel bad that there's so much coal and not diamonds. So let's just implement diamonds with a very, very uh, low rate of, so I'm going to do, seven here is going to be diamonds and diamonds literally are going to be the exact same thing as coal. Um, should I populate with coal slash diamonds? So that we're going to do that. And then we're going to say, are going to populate with minerals, minerals. So this is going to be coal and this is going to be diamond. So for diamond, we're going to roll the dice again. So we're going to get another, and then we're going to say that if the probability of this, I'm just going to add another zero because diamonds are very rare, you know, this should be the value of seven. I'm going to do that. I'm going to implement the case for the value of seven. And you see, ah, there are some here. They already showed up. So I'm going to copy and paste this for the value of seven. And then let's choose a nice color. So that's going to be what is going to light cyan. And that's what I'm going to do. Light cyan. Oh. Light cyan. And then boom. You see? This looks a bit off, but uh, yeah, well, they are findable. Something that we could do to extend this also is the idea that in real world Minecraft, uh, minerals don't show up as one unit, they show up in clusters uh, or close to each other. So that is something that we could also extend at some point. Okay. And I think the next thing I would like to do is I'm going to implement some kind of underground structures. So in real mine, in real mine, 
in real world Minecraft, in the, in the game, you have these caverns that are basically this winding sort of linear, curvilinear entity. Sometimes they open up into more spherical spaces. Sometimes they have this kind of cliff or rich um, formation. There's a very rich uh, algorithm to generate all these nature-inspired formations. That actually it's not straightforward to implement. So what I'm going to do for the sake of simplicity in this exercise is just I'm going to try to implement some kind of spherical cavities. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to we're going to randomly generate holes in the terrain and we're going to empty the space around those around those terrains around those holes. So how are we going to do that? The way I'm going to do that is that I'm actually going to go all the way to after I have generated, let's say, the solid chunks or the chunks with materials. And then what I'm going to do now is I'm going to do another process after this where I'm going to generate random cavities and I'm going to go back to my block types and I'm going to hollow out anything that it's part of, um, that is very close to one of these holes. So how are we going to do this? So we're going to carve out some cavities, all right? The first thing we're going to do is we're going to decide, we're going to decide how many holes should show up in this piece of terrain. The way we can do that is, for example, I'm going to say hole count is going to be a random number. So RND can give me numbers, random numbers with decimal part, but can also give me integers. So if I choose next, I can actually control what kind of integer value I get between zero or between a minimum and a maximum. So what that could be, for example, is let's say that I want a random chance to have somewhere between zero and three holes, okay? So that's going to be, that's actually, if I want three holes, by the way, I need to choose the number four because next is guaranteed to never give you the, the, the actual maximum value that you're choosing, okay? So, and then I'm going to print to the console, generating uh, uh, holes, okay? So I'm going to do that. And then you can see that as I do that, this is getting very heavy. Okay, so I'm going to see here that this one already has three holes. Schedule four. All right, so then I'm going to do a for loop. This is perhaps like the least, the part where the least optimal and more optimization could be used. Um, but I'm going to, um, I'm just going to, for the sake of uh, getting it done properly, I'm going to say h equals zero, equals zero, h is less than whole count and then h plus plus. So we're going to create a for loop for each one of the three, four, two holes that we generate randomly. And then for each one of these, what I want to do is I want to create, I want to calculate a random x, y, z location for this, for this object. So what is that going to be? So for example, h, x, so the coordinate x of this hole is going to be a random coordinate. So in integer, so because we are in voxel space, our coordinates are measured as 0, 1, 2, 3, right? A random number between 0 and how many voxels I have in the x direction, correct? For y is going to be the same. So it's going to be a random number between 0 and how many voxels I have in the z direction. For z, I could do the same thing. But if I did this, I could run into the chance that the hole would be somewhere center in the top air part. So maybe what I want to do is I want for this hole to be either somewhere in V, so somewhere below the height of the, below half the height, or I want to be somewhere uh, in the quarter of the height somewhere around those lines. If we integrated this with the generation of these guys here, then perhaps we could also control the depth, okay? But we're not gonna get into that right now. So 
what are we going to do here? So what we're going to do is we are going to just random, just get our random chance here. Now, what I would like to do is I'm going to go over a for loop, okay? Oh, and then in a random radius, we have to do that as well. So I'm going to say, for this, I'm going to use a number. So for example, I'm going to say a number with decimal part. So double is going to be HR. The radius of the circle is going to be random. Next double. And because double is always going to be from zero to one, I'm going to amplify this by whatever the maximum radius can be. And the maximum radius is going to be this value here. Okay. It's going to be this value here, which is going to be, I don't want the radius to be larger than half of the terrain, than a quarter of the terrain. Okay. Then with this, I already have, for example, and just make sure to print them out. I'm going to print H x and and then plus h y plus h z plus the h radius okay i'm going to run this code and then here i should get a dump of the random coordinates and the radius of these holes here okay beautiful i'm going to make this half the height just so that we have a little bit of variation just just for the let me show you that up oh. and did i ever include the seed oh i never actually included the seed here that's why i'm getting random numbers all of a sudden yes so i never really included the seed here i apologize for that so this is okay all right, so, and what that means is that for this particular seed, interestingly, I am generating no holes whatsoever. So let me change this to the value of one, for example, and let's see what we get. And generating one hole, all right, beautiful. So now we have one hole, and um, what if I do two? Let's get at least a couple holes or cavities. Okay, now three. Okay, so this one has three holes. I like that. So now we have this. So now what I need to do is I need to go with a for loop. I basically, and this is the least optimal part of the code, I need to go with a for loop over each one of the voxels, correct? And then I need to calculate the distance of that voxel to the hole that we're calculating right now. And if, and if the distance is smaller than the radius, then we turn that block into air. All right. So I'm going to, and this is not very optimal because I have to basically for loop over every single, every single voxel. So we could write something where we only iterate over the picks, the voxels that are in the vicinity of H, X, S, Y, and H, C. All right. But that's a bit more complicated. It would take its own video to calculate. So let's not, let's not get there right now. So what I'm going to do is here, I'm going to say double D is going to be equal to the distance between, um, uh, what is that going to be? Uh, the distance, uh, so I'm going to say dx is going to be equal to the distance between h and minus hx. So dy is going to be equal to y and minus hy. And then z is going to be equal to c and z. And because this is always going to be the same for this for loop, I'm just going to move it here because y is not changing and the same for x because x is going to be the same. I'm just going to move it all the way up there so that I don't calculate the same thing over and over again. And then after that, what I'm going to do is I'm going to do some other calculation where I'm going to calculate the distance, correct? So what is that going to look like? Um, double D, the distance is going to be dx times dx. I'm going to use Pythagoras here, dy times dy plus dc times dc, all right? 
And I'm going to call this the square distance because I'm not going to use the square root. I'm just going to keep this as it is. And then because instead of I can save myself the square root calculation, if I compare the square value of the distance with the square value of the radius. So if d2 is smaller than hr times hr, and I could probably do, um, I can probably just, actually hr2 is going to be hr plus hr, I can calculate this just once, you know? h, if this is smaller than the square of the radius, then that means that we are inside. And therefore, block type, block type in the coordinates x, y, and z, x, y, and z, this one should be a block of f. Okay? Is this going to work? Okay, no, it doesn't work. Let me see. I probably have a typo. Block types. Yes, I'm missing it. an s. All right, so let's see if this works. All right, so we can see a small cavity here showing up. We can see something here also showing up. Nice. And there must be some, there must be a third one somewhere there. Can we crank up the maximum radius? So VC, can we crank this up to the value of two? And can we make these folks a bit larger? Oh, well, now it's kind of a little too much. <laughs> All right, but why not? So we're going to open this up here. Okay. And then we have these two openings. Wow, this one looks pretty cool, actually. You see this one? This one looks like a legit Minecraft cave, huh? <laughs> All right, I'm liking this. Yes, 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 yes. Okay, but now, guess what? This is kind of legit. It looks like an opening that we could kind of really like a cave, like a superficial cave. But this one looks weird. So in Minecraft, we do have these holes that poke out all the way to the, to the air. But, um, but if this was true, then we probably should have some kind of waterfall uh, spilling over here right so i wonder if we just don't want this situation to be possible or if we want to make some kind of water simulation of sorts let me think about that yes i thought about it i did a quick test and it seems like we can get something going on so what i'm going to propose is that in order to mimic the water falling down we're going to implement like a really really basic propagation rule where what we're going to do is we're going to for each one if we look in plan for each one of the x y locations what we're going to do is we're going to iterate over all the voxels starting from the top and we're going to see so long as we are going down through air we're going to keep going 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 until we hit a first until we hit water if we hit dirt we're not going to keep going but if we hit water what we're going to do is we're going to keep going down through the water and see if if we hit sand we also stop but if we hit air as long as we keep hitting air 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 what we're going to do is we're going to change that air voxel into a water voxel what that's going to do is that all these water voxels that are kind of floating in the air are going to become sort of waterfalls that are going to drain down towards any empty voxel that is going to be underneath. So let me show you how we're going to do that. So we have chaos some gravity cavities here. So I'm going to say here, propagate some waterfalls. All right. So how are we going to do that? I'm going to do a nested for loop in x and y. So we're going to if we imagine a top view perspective, we're going to check all the X and Y coordinates, all right? And we're going to start the propagation rule by going to the very top voxel and going down from there. So I'm going to say, I'm going to start by saying, I'm going to figure out what is the Z surface? What is the, what is the Z height of the most 
surface voxel that is not air. I'm going to start at VC at the very top and I'm going to start going down. And then for that, I'm going to assume that the surface type of the type of that surface or that C kite that I'm looking at is going to be air. All right. And then what I'm going to do is I'm going to, with a while loop, I'm going to start going down in the Z direction until I find some voxel that is not air. So how is that going to look? So while I'm checking, while surface type equals zero, so so long as I'm still hitting air, keep going down. And also for the safety, maybe we find something that is just all air. If that's the case, for example, like here, you see that this will be all air. We want to make sure that we stop at the zero height. So whenever serve C is, as long as this is greater than zero, because we don't want to get trapped into an infinite loop, so long as the surface type is air and we are still above zero, what I want to do is I want to go down one notch and then I want to check what is the surface type of the next voxel right underneath. So surface Z is going to be, I'm going to decrease it by one. And then surface type is going to be equal to block types. And then for C, I'm going to choose surface Z. Okay. All right. This is a little abstract. So let's make sure that whenever this is done, we print to the console some message making sure that we print out what have we found. So I'm going to print the X, Y coordinate and then the surface C, where did we stop and what kind of, uh, of block did we find? I'm going to execute this. It's going to take a little bit because our mesh generation is getting kind of heavy. All right. But we will see that we now have a printout here. So let me go to the top view. The top view is zero, zero, is of the type one because it we, for some reason we have this dirt block here that might be a, a glitch and if we stop going up zero one two three in the y direction we keep getting grass 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 which was number four okay and then as we keep going up you see that at some point in pixel 31 this turns into water 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 that's number two and then we have air 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 at z zero and then we get water back at Z15 and then water all the way until the end in this row. Okay, so that seems to be working. We have been able to found what is the first voxel in the Z direction that is not air. Okay, beautiful. So we're going to continue the logic here. Maybe I'm going to cancel, not print this out. And then what I want to do here is, so this is, find the first non-air voxel, all right? Now, the next thing is if found water, find the next non-water voxel right as you go down. So what we're going to do here, if, if surface type, the one that we found is equal to two, that's water, correct? Then what we want to do is we want to keep going down and we want to keep going down and then make sure that we keep going down so long as we are inside of water. So we basically want to find which one is the first block that is not water as we keep going down. So we're going to follow a very similar rule as here. We're going to do another one where surface type, so long as this is water and we are still over the threshold, go one unit below and check out the type here. Okay. So now I'm going to copy this and let's see what we find when we go down. So this is going to be only for water types. Okay. So now the printout is going to be only for whatever is in water. So zero and 31, you see that for this one, we found sand. Remember five, and we have five blocks of sand. One, two, three, four, and five. One, two, three, four, and five. And the rest, we have five blocks of air. One, two, three, air, you see? And then it jumps air, 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 a lot of air. Uh, sorry, no, and this is, so this is five blocks of air, another five, and then it's back to water, okay? 
All right, so it looks like this is working so far. So now what I need to do, uh, what I need to do is what? What do I need to do? Okay, so now we need to do another one here where we say, well, if what you found is now air again, so I'm going to write a comment, if we found air, change air to water until we find non air because we might be changing the air into water but then we find rock or we find dirt or we find something else and we want to stop there so if surface type the one that we found is air and surface zero is greater than zero okay so long, no, sorry. If we found air, <laughs> if we found air, then we're going to do another while loop. And we're going to say so long as the surface type that we're finding is air and we are over zero, then here what we're going to do is another thing. So we're going to, I'm going to remove all of this. And what I'm going to do is the block that I found at surface Z, that's the height at which we are, I want this to turn it into water. So I'm going to say that the type of this now has to be number two. Then I'm going to go down one unit, surface Z minus minus, okay? And then, <coughs> excuse me, if what we're going to do here is we're going to say that block types, we're going to say that surface type we're going to read with what is the type of the next block underneath. So that's going to be block type equals whatever is right under. And if this is air, we will keep iterating, otherwise we will stop. So let's see if this works. I'm going to press OK. I'm going to now go here and see what? Nice. Can you see this? Beautiful. All right, but we now have a tiny bit of a glitch here, a voxel that is not showing up. We're not going all the way down. So can we fix this? So we can probably find a more elegant way to define the while loop, this condition here, the decrements. But I think the problem is that whenever we go down, if we were to say less or equal to zero, because we go down here once, this is going to give me an error because it's an index out of bounds because at some point this becomes minus one, okay? So what I can do here is I can say if surface Z is less than zero, then just break the for loop. We don't want to keep doing anything else, okay? So I'm going to see if this works. And Yes, very good. Now the water is falling all the way down. Ta -da! How awesome is this? Uh, now we have this kind of water propagation, waterfall. I mean, it's not perfect. If the water was not overflowing and if it didn't have air underneath, we were not doing the thing where the water would kind of pour to the side, right? So it's not perfect, but I'm going to leave that exercise to you, the viewer, to improve this. Because one thing that I also want to go over is changing the seed and figuring out what like po different possible arrangements for this kind of, of terrain. So you can see that right now, the only thing that happens when I change the seed is that I get, um, is that I get different locations of the, the pockets, right? But this is not affecting at all the how the terrain is showing up. And actually you can see that right now this definition is coming very, very heavy. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to implement a few, I'm going to implement a few optimizations that you're, that I'm not going to record in this video. If you want to see how I did that, please feel free to go to the, um, to the live stream where I did this, a card will be popping up in the corner. But the optimizations that I'm going to do is that I'm going to output here. Instead of integers, I'm going to output grasshopper integers so that 
this component is going to go faster because it doesn't have to do the conversion between integer and grasshopper integer. So that's one thing. And then you can see that these components here are very heavy. That is because this component is having to run basically 131,000 times to compare one value and another. The comparison is very cheap, but executing this component 131,000 times is very expensive. So I'm going to replace this with a C sharp component that just compares the list and this number and it will be much faster. So let me do that so that we can be a bit more fluid here and I'll come back to this main video. And here you have it. So I have accelerated the voxel terrain drastically by changing the output from an integer type to a grasshopper integer. So this avoids grasshopper having to do the conversion between native C-sharp types and the types that Grasshopper uses to exchange information between components. Because we do that directly, um, that saves a lot of time. And this is also much faster now because for the same reason, I'm using Grasshopper Booleans and I'm using a generic type to avoid automatic conversions that Grasshopper has to do. So it's a much cheaper operation. Again, if you're interested in learning about this, just go to the live stream and see how I did this and why I did this, okay? But now we have a much faster way of iterating through different possibilities. So you can see that as I change the seed, I can start seeing like many different options that show up. And you can see like the tiny waterfall. This is kind of cool, huh? Uh, I see that my algorithm is not fully working. Something is wrong. This water should be cascading down. So I will eventually fix this at some point. But yes, that needs to take a, that needs a closer look. And, but something that is, I'm not fully satisfied is that as I am changing the random seed, the only thing that's pretty much happening is that the coal is changing and the location of the holes is changing. But I would like also the terrain to change. So if we look at the code, something that we are currently not accounting for is the fact that the sine wave that we're using to generate the terrain is pretty much always the exact same sine wave. We have not incorporated any randomness and any random variation in this sine wave at all. So something that we may want to do is before we go on to generate this sine, this sine wave, we may want to generate, we may throw, want to throw the random dice a little to generate some numbers that will help me give some random character or some random variation to this surface. So what am I going to do here? I'm going to do the following. I'm going to say, you know what? These two numbers, 32 and 16, are too hard-coded. So maybe I want to create like some slight variation of those two numbers. So for example, let's say that I'm going to create here a value that is going to be random um, x amplitude. And that's going to be a value that is going to be, I don't know, somewhere between, I want to be in the range of 32. So what I can do is I can say, I'm going to make it 28 and then plus eight times rnd dot next double. And because this will be a value from zero to one, this will be a value from zero to eight, which means that this value, the random amplitude will go from anywhere between 28 and 36. So that is four points of separation, if you will. So now I'm going to replace this here and I'm going to do a similar thing for the Y amplitude. So this is 16, maybe I want to give it like two units of variation. So that's going to be 16, that will be 14 and then four, so that it goes up and down four units, okay? random y amplitude. We may want to do the same thing for these two values here. So let's let's see if this is working so far. So I'm going to do this and then I get some random y amplitude. I have a typo here. So I'm going to calculate this and you can see that um, now if I move my slider, you can see that there is some variation in the amplitude, so I get some difference in the terrain, but it's not a lot, okay? So something else that I can do is I can basically, remember Graftoy when we were drawing the sine curve? 
So something that I can do is I can move the sine curve in X and Y. So that is just as simple as giving an offset to this angle here. So here I can add a number that will give it an offset. So how can I do that, for example? So let's say that I'm going to create here double random random offset in the random x offset and that's going to be a number that is going to be anywhere 100 times random next double for example or a, a thousand times so i can just really go to town here and then random y offset and then here i can just include that and then here i can just include the random y offset okay and if i do that then you can see that my terrain is basically virtually moving, right? So I can now have this, and you can see that I get the, I get much more interesting variations here. Okay. Beautiful. And I can see that I still have this, uh, what is going on here? Yes, I don't know what's going on there. So let's go back to four. Yes, and we still have the spilling water. This is so nice. Come on. All right. I think this is the one that I'm going to bake as my solution. So I am going to bake this solution. I'm going to make this fully opaque. Yes. And then I'm just going to bake all of these guys. So I'm going to bake the the water the dirt i'm going to bake the water i'm going to bake you know what the water i'm going to bake it with the transparency so that i see if that works out in the renderer i'm here i'm going to bake the coal i'm going to bake the green the sand i'm going to bake the stone and i'm going to bake the diamonds and i'm going to shut down i'm going to do a render view whoa nice 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 and then if i do a clipping plane that is going to be a vertical clipping plane i'm going to start here i'm going to start here and we're going to have this kind of clipping plane here so I can now traverse through the world that I've created and you can see the nice cuts in the water, in the sand. Uh, how awesome is this, folks? We have created a sort of random kind of uh, Minecraft voxel world. Now, of course, we can extend this to we can extend this to add trees, to add tiny grass objects. We can, we can work better on the propagation. We can add a more elaborate cave system. But I mean, this is pretty much a sample implementation. So I think I'm pretty satisfied with this. Nice. So, and also this is, each one of these are fully fleshed meshes. So if you wanted, you could 3D print this. You either multi-material, simple material, FDM, polyjet. There's all the options in the world now because we have a nice close watertight mesh for each one of the, of the objects, right? So very nice, very nice. I'm very happy with this. I think it looks pretty cool. <laughs> And yes, so that's what I'm going to, that's where I'm going to leave it here uh, in the, for this video. Thank you very much. And if you like what you saw, if you learned something, maybe share the word with other people, like this video, subscribe to the channel and all those things that we do in modern YouTube world. Thank you very much and hopefully see you in some other video. Bye bye.